So we've invited uh, Tracy and Mark in today, and if people don't know, the uh, leads this year are all working kind of out of one area for the math, literacy, and technology leads. So they're doing a lot of things together. I'm trying to bring all those pieces together and, and have a little different approach uh, this year. So Mark and Tracy are doing, both are doing some components of today, but it's uh, related to math, and then a little bit of a technology piece as well, um, related to some things you talked about last year um, John did a bit of a discussion with the teachers who got some input about math needs and literacy needs and also with the demonstration school project there was a there was a PD survey with that as well. So themes from those uh, elements were kind of put into the PD day to day. So I'm going to introduce Tracy. I think you all know her, Tracy Craig, and uh, I turn it over everybody. to her at this everybody. time. So thank you Tracy for coming in and being with us today. <laughs> So what we're going to talk about today is one of the needs that you guys had mentioned with John, I think it was back in April, because Mark uh, gave me the list of what you guys had mentioned that you wanted, was some assessment practices. So we're going to talk about some best assessment practices to use in the math classroom. And before we get started, on your, on your um, handout that I gave you, I put a little sticky note on it. So what I'd like you to do, um, <laughs> what's that? Sorry, you can have yeah. right here, Aaron. Okay. What I want you to do is I want you to fill up the post-it note with what can you what do you know about this shape? So try to fill up what you can or tell me what you know about that shape. And I'll give you about three minutes to do that, and then we're gonna come back to that activity later on in the presentation. So in order to talk about assessment, we have to talk kind of about different components of a balanced assessment. There's the formative and there's the summative assessment, and that's basically what we're going to be talking a lot about today is the formative assessment. But you also have to keep in mind the self, the authentic, the standardized testing that happens in grades 3 and grade 5, and as well as the traditional. So the first thing that we're going to talk about today is formative assessment. And formative assessment, as you guys already know, and a lot of this is going to be specific, just for you guys, is it's, it's assessment that occurs regularly. It's mostly informal at times, and it has to be happening on a daily basis in your class. Why should it be happening on a daily basis in your class? Well, it has to, you have to know where the children are in order to move them along and plan further lessons. And research shows that formative assessment is way better than summative assessment because it provides larger gains for students, especially your lower achievers. So if you're doing formative assessment every day in your classroom, you're finding those little ones that are having those misconceptions about math in the class, and then you're able to go back and fix it the next day or to try to fix it. So this comes right from the curriculum document, and it's examples of formative assessment that you will see. And if you can't see it there, it's kind of small, I have it on the handout. What I'd like you to do right now is just take a look at the different examples of formative assessment there are and try to see which ones do you use in your classroom and maybe which ones would you like to use this year in your classroom. So are there any up there that you already use and you're like, I use that on a regular basis? Observations. Oh, observations? Mm -hmm. Joanne, how do you do observations? Uh, just circulating the room. Sometimes when we do the whiteboard activities, you can see who's getting it, who's not. Yeah. But a lot of circulating the room, watching as listening to discussions. Yeah. And so you just kind of in the back of your mind, you, you make a mental note like, okay, there's a couple here that I need to work with on this strategy. Yeah. And sometimes I'll record them and record them again as well. So uh -huh. I'll kind of like yeah, absolutely. And that's something that goes on every day. Like we, <coughs> every teacher does that. Is, is there any other one up there that? I use math, math journals. journals. Math journals. But I use it as like an exit. For the as an exit card? Yeah. How often would you use math journals? Almost every day. Every day. Mm -hmm. Some that don't run at a time. Yeah. They, they are a little, we're going to talk a lot about math journals in this okay. because it's really a good formative assessment and it's done from kindergarten to grade five. So, Any other ones up there? Stacy? I created a kid friendly rubric for doing a more constructive response type questions so the kids would know that they needed to be able to problem solve and show their work, all those things that they use for the end of the year assessment. So for the grade five, the provincial assessment rubric is and what you're talking three. about? So for those people who aren't in grade three and grade five, there's the constructive response where they're given 
a provincial rubric and actually have that in there. And it's from the Math Makes Sense. I didn't know that, but it's from the one of the Math Makes Sense, where they're tested on conceptual knowledge and communication and problem solving skills, and they're scored a two, a one, or a zero. So making a child friendly one and getting them used to being scored that way is, is really good. All right. So math journals, it's my favorite thing. I love it. Mm -hmm. I love math journals. I used it when I taught kindergarten and I thought it was so fun to do at the beginning of the year and then it's just like reading, you know, their, their journals for literacy. You can see the progress from September to, to June. And I really think it's a true picture of what they're learning. And an open-ended question can differentiate that learning level and you can see what they know, what they don't know, and where you need to go next. And the thing about math journals is that it should be done on a regular basis, like, like Caitlin said. It doesn't necessarily have to be done on a daily basis. When we were talking at the office about math journals, a lot of teachers say, well, how often should I be using math journals in my classroom? And we typically try to say at least two to three times a week. And the important thing with, with the math journals is when you're starting them off, you need to model and show. Look at this example. If you have a, if you have a scanner in your classroom or if you have a document camera in your classroom, Take it under, show them, and say, look at this, and look what they wrote, and, you know, isn't this good, and, and, and that sort of thing. To show them what they need to kind of incorporate in their math journals. Here's an example of a, um, this is grade one, first week of school. Make a pattern. So that's a pretty easy journal question that you can ask. And you can even ask that right after grade five. Make a pattern. Explain your pattern. So this student did an ABC pattern. And I thought it was neat because I said to the teacher, why did he do this? And she said, I thought the same thing too. So the next day, she went back and asked him. And he said, well, I finished my, I finished my pattern, so then I started to, wanted to make a colored pattern. So I was doing light, dark, light, dark, light. And then he said, I forgot this one when he went back and looked at it. So it was pretty, it was pretty neat. And here's an example of, oh, the other one was kindergarten. So this one's, this one's grade one. How can you show 10? And I thought, I'm doing math. I thought that was pretty neat. You might want to work with some spacing in there, but that's a literacy issue, I guess. But um, he did 8 plus 1 equals 10. But then he did 5 plus 5 equals 10. 0 plus 10 is 10. I thought this was really cool when he did 3 plus 1, and I wanted to know what that meant. He said it's not equal to 10. I thought that was pretty cool. So with math journals, what you can do is when you have the children working on it, the best way to do it is when they hand in their math journals, make sure they hand them in open and you make a pile and you can quickly go through and it takes less than five minutes to do it at the end and you can look through and say they got it, they got it, they didn't get it. So you have your pile of math journal entries that they're really not getting that concept and they're the ones that you're going to do a guided math lesson with in the next day or the day after to try to get them to understand the concept. So with this little guy here, I would want to talk to him about, you know, he did this one and this one. I'd want to hear more about this, but I'd ask him, are there any other ways that you can show 10 without using number sentences? I'd want to see him like modeling the number, like making 10 bugs or, you know, something like that or using base 10 blocks. Here's an example of a grade grade three. And I included this one because he doesn't really have a lot. He doesn't really have a lot. He modeled the number. He said 246 is even, but he didn't really explain how he knew it was even. And he said it's bigger than 231. So what was interesting about this is this, the teacher had been working on breaking numbers up. He wasn't able to say that there's two hundreds, four tens, six ones. He wasn't able to say that there's 24 tens in that number. So that really shows his number sense really is not there when it comes to three-digit numbers. So when I had to do this activity earlier, what do you know about this shape? We did this at the when we were at the Department of Education meetings earlier in September. Um, Kathy Martin, who was the head of math for the, for the province, she had us all do this. And we were saying, why is she making us do this? But it was a really neat activity. She made us all go around the room and we had to say one thing that we knew about the shape. But the rule was is we weren't able to say something that's already been said. And there was, I think, 47 people in the room when we had to come up with 47 ways to describe the shape. 
So she said, you guys are all the math people, so we need 47 ways to explain the shape. So I'm going to start with Trina. Oh, <laughs> yes, it's a square. It's a square. Okay. Shapers. Four corners. Four corners. Four sides. Four sides. Four sides. <laughs> Don't you say it. Two dimensional. It's two dimensional. It's one face of a cube. One face of a cube. Look at you. Oh, awesome.